can also talk about why that is. Basically, I'm going to talk about three things. I don't want to talk for too long, but I want to say three things. One is that since 9-11, the rules around surveillance have changed, so what the government is allowed to do has changed very drastically, and the Patriot Act is only one part of that. The second is that a, a huge amount of resources have been dedicated towards expanding the surveillance state throughout the nation, far beyond the NSA, the CIA, and the FBI. And the third part is related to jurisdictions. So whereas, you know, it used to be the federal government's business to spy on people and to, you know, do sort of, you know, intelligence work, etc. Now it's the business of local police, of state police. Um, so we're going to talk about that too. So to the first point on rules. You all probably have heard about the Patriot Act. Uh, the Patriot Act basically eviscerated the Fourth Amendment. Who can say what the Fourth Amendment does? Anybody? That's right. It requires that the government have probable, what's called probable cause to search your stuff, to come in your house and take your stuff, to, to come at you and say, give me your laptop, give me your wallet, I want to see your contacts, I want to read your email. This is what the Fourth Amendment is supposed to do. It's supposed to protect us from, from improper government intrusion, intrusion into our private lives where the government has no business, right? Unless they think we've done something wrong, and then they're supposed to show a warrant to a judge, or show evidence to a judge, and the judge will sign a warrant. That's how it used to be. Not, a, not anymore. Not after the case you have. In a bunch of different ways. One of them is what's called a national security letter. Does anybody know what that is? So national security letters are these secret letters that the FBI will write. And the FBI themselves writes these letters. They don't even need to get a judge to write these letters. An FBI agent will write a national security letter and hand it to you. You work at an, you know, you host a web serving company, whatever, and, you know, say you host Democracy Now! on your web server. The FBI writes you an NSL and says we want information about every single person who's visited Democracy Now!'s website in the past 10 years. This, so, the other thing about the NSO, this is unbelievable, is that if you're the recipient of an NSO, you can't tell anyone. There's a guy who used to be, uh, he was a client for the ACLU, the National ACLU, who was a recipient of an NSO, of a national security letter. He ran a web hosting company. In fact, Democracy Now! was one of his clients. And uh, he got this NSO, and, and part of it was that the government said, you can't tell anyone, not your wife, not your parents, not anyone. He told his lawyers, and we sued. Um, but he, he, he was, he, you know, he broke up with his girlfriend because of this because he kept leaving the house and lying to her. He couldn't tell her he was going to be with his lawyers. She dumped him because she thought he was cheating on her. Real people. All right. So national security letters. Um, the Patriot Act also did another thing, which a lot of people don't know, which is really terrifying and applies to the activists here. Uh, which is to define domestic terrorism so broadly as to encompass almost anything, <laughs> literally almost anything, at a federal building, right? So I'm going to read you this definition because it's really worth hearing, word for word. So a person engages in domestic terrorism if they do an act, quote, dangerous to human life, that is a violation of any criminal law, whether it's state law or federal law, if the act appears intended to, appears intended to, people, appears, okay? Who, who says whether it appears or not? A dangerous to human life that appears intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. Intimidate. I think that some guys are headed over to the Federal Reserve right now. They might intimidate someone. That's domestic terrorism. Influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion. Affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. The last one is pretty obviously terrorism. The first two, not so much, right? So if these acts occur within the United States, that's considered domestic terrorism and can be prosecuted as such as a serious federal crime. If it's outside the U.S., it's considered international terrorism. Okay, so... This, this is the Patriot Act. Really, really bad news. As we all know, Barack Obama, big, big fan of the Patriot Act. So the second part about that is FBI guidelines. FBI has internal guidelines 
that are written based on uh, guidelines that the Attorney General of the United States sets out called the, the Attorney General Guidelines for, for Domestic Investigations or something like that. The FBI guidelines were changed in 2002, 2008, and again about three months ago in 2011. So basically now that there aren't guidelines, I mean it's funny that they still call them guidelines because there basically aren't any guidelines anymore. The FBI can search through your trash for no reason. They can find out all sorts of open source information on you for no reason. They can look through all their databases, all these private databases, government databases, gathering information about you. They don't have to have a reason for this. They can pay informants to go spy on you in your mosque, synagogue, church for no reason. They can follow you around everywhere you go for no reason. Uh, they don't have to have a reason to spy on you anymore. Um, it used to be that they did. Because after COINTELPRO, after the spying scandals of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when the FBI was found to have really improperly spied on and messed with uh, social justice movements in this country, there was something called the Church Commission, which was set up to stop that. And those, that was when the first FBI guidelines were written. And those first FBI guidelines said that, in fact, the FBI did have to have a reason to investigate. They had to believe that you were involved in criminal activity. Not anymore. Not anymore. And we see, if you guys have been paying attention to what's been going on in New York City, that this sort of mindset about, you know, reasonable suspicion of probable cause having nothing to do with law enforcement has trickled all the way down to local police. So now the NYPD is investigating Muslims solely because they are Muslims. The only reason is because they are Muslims. This is happening CIA. nationwide. What? They're backed by the CIA, too. And backed by the CIA, that's right. And that's that's really not conspiracy. I mean, it's written in AP, so... Okay, so then, so that's number two. The FBI's guidelines have been drastically deregulated to the point where they're basically meeting us. And the third thing is that the NSA, I'm sure you guys all remember, in 2005 when the New York Times reported after sitting on it for a year at the bequest of the Bush administration, that the NSA was warrantless, warrantlessly spying on Americans. What that means is that they were listening to your phone calls, reading your emails, looking at your web activity, without any due process whatsoever, without a judge ever looking at evidence, without evidence. Um, so this was brought to light in 2005. There was a big scandal. People made a big deal out of it. Nothing changed. In fact, the Congress, the Congress wrote into law that now the NSA has the power to do this. So... Thank you, Congress. Um, when that story broke, one of the guys who was a whistleblower who worked for AT&T, which was one of the companies that was just giving information over to the NSA like it was, you know, candy to children, um, Mark Klein, this guy, said that the NSA stores a copy of every email written in the world. We have no reason to believe that that, that has changed. Um, so, so that's the rules part. The rules, there are no rules. The government can spy on you whenever it wants, basically. The second piece is about technology. The past 10 years has seen incredible developments in surveillance technology. A lot of times, these are technologies that are developed for use in foreign military theaters, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, um, and then they're brought home to police and control the, the domestic population. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. Uh, one of them is biometrics. Biometrics, how many of you guys have heard of face and iris scanning technologies? Okay, so facial, facial recognition essentially takes a picture of your face and maps all these different little points on it, uses a computer algorithm um, to, you know, find out the distance between your eyes and the distance between your nose and your eyes, etc., etc. No person has, you know, a face that's like anyone else's, so it's basically like a fingerprint of your face. Um, same with iris scan. So these technologies are being rolled out throughout the nation. It's, it's a relatively quiet operation. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how it's being rolled out, but biometrics is one of them. Here in Massachusetts as well. Surveillance cameras. If you look, you can see there's one there, there's one there. They're all over the place. They're up there. Uh, you can't walk through an urban area without being, uh, you know, under the watchful eye of probably hundreds of surveillance cameras. Many of them are, are private, they're commercial, they're owned by, you know, whoever owns these buildings. Many of them are government. They're owned by the Department of Homeland Security, by local police. Um, often, 
and increasingly, private companies, and particularly large private companies, are giving access, they're giving uh, the police access to, to their cameras. So uh, the Boston police has access to a number of private corporations' cameras, like on a live feed. Um, so that's two. And surveillance cameras, they're not what you see on TV exactly, but it's getting close. Uh, to the degree that, for example, in Chicago, where there are like something like 60,000 cameras in downtown Chicago, it's really insane. Um, they have this technology that allows the police to actually track you while you're walking down the street, moving from camera to camera. So there's that. There's facial recognition, which, when paired with um, video camera technology, really will just like destroy any modicum of privacy that we have left, uh, because it will be able, you know, it will enable police to be able to see who's on the street at all times, essentially. Um, there is also something called video analytics, which enables people to, for example, the Chinese government is using video analytics technology that was actually purchased, um, they, they bought from a company that's based here in Massachusetts. That's the other thing, a lot of this stuff comes from Massachusetts, it's no surprise, we have MIT and Harvard. Uh, a lot of technology is developed here, a lot of military technology, a lot of surveillance technology. Anyway, the Chinese government has bought a lot of it uh, because, you know, they're really, really interested in repressing democracy in their country. Um, and one of the things that they're using video analytics for is to see uh, when more than five people gather in any spot, um, you know, it'll set off an alert so that people will look at that camera and see what's going on there. So that's essentially saying anytime there's a gathering of people in public, potentially a political demonstration, you know, there's a red flag. So people don't have to always monitor these cameras. There are ways in which the technology itself can be taught to look for suspicious activity or political activity, etc. Then there are listening devices, uh, ears. I don't know if you've ever been to a protest in New York, but the NYPD, which is essentially a military now, has these giant, uh, what they call them rabbit ears or something, but they're like large parabolic microphones that can be pointed at, you know, uh, like, there was one test where in a crowded baseball stadium, or basketball stadium, rather, I don't know how, how many of you guys have ever been to a Celtics game, but it is loud in there, um, where they point one of these machines at people sitting in one of the back rows from across, from across the stadium, and they can drown out all the other noise and hear exactly what those people are saying. This is the kind of technology that, that is used today. Um, there's so much more. Night vision goggles, infrared cameras, what they call backscatter machines, which are essentially x-rays that they drive around in trucks um, so that they can see through people's cars. Um, license plate readers, that's a big one in Massachusetts. We are dealing with license plate readers up the wazoo with this state right now, and then it's like spreading like wildfire throughout the state. Um, these things essentially read license plates at a rate of something like a thousand per hour, um, you know, they just clock every plate that passes them, they mark the GPS location of where the plate was captured, uh, you know, the make and model of the car, take a picture of the car, um, and, you know, can run that license plate against any number of lists. So the list could be, it could be, frankly, anything. I mean, the cops could put in, you know, you, you're at this demonstration, we don't like you, you put, put her in the list, right? And then anytime your car is seen by one of these machines, it's going to be caught. It's information the police want to keep forever. They want to keep it forever. And not just on criminals, but on everyone. This enables the tracking tracking of motorists on a vast scale that really needs to be dealt with. If you're interested in fighting this, you should talk to me. We're working really hard to stop it. Um, databases. So, there's a term that I don't know if I, if I made it up, but I like it. It's called data balance, right? That's kind of what's going on right now. Is that all of this information, information from those sur surveillance technologies I just described, information from all of your internet activity, your financial activity, where you live, your healthcare information, etc. Anything you, that you can imagine that's in digital form is in a database. It might be in 20. Uh, you know, law enforcement buys database information from private companies like Choice Point and Lexis Nexus. Lexis Nexus. Some of you might be lost in you know about Lexis. Lexis has some bad business in other fields besides selling you uh, law information. They do a lot of data aggregation and sell it to the police. Um, and the police also have their own database. The FBI has a database called Next Generation Identification, NGI. They put 
plan to gather biometric information on every single person on the planet, and they want to have it on you and everybody else. They want to have your iris scan, your face. They want to have your scent and gait information, the way you walk, what you smell like. Um, they want to have information about your tattoos and your markings. They want to have all of this data connected to your social security number, your name, your address, to everywhere you've ever been, to where you went to school, um, potentially political and religious affiliations. It's really, it's quite scary. You know, some people say, why should I care if I'm not doing anything wrong? Why should I care that the FBI has, you know, knows everything about me? Um, why should I care that I'm being monitored by police cameras everywhere I go? Well, my answer to that is that you should go live in China or Iran, if you don't mind, right? Because in a democracy, that's not supposed to be how it is. In a democracy, we are supposed to know more about the government than the government knows about us. Unfortunately, the situation is exactly the opposite at present. And we really need to counteract that. And if someone asks you why should I care, you should really engage in a conversation with them about it because we're really losing this battle in this country. And like Ray McGovern said, we don't want to, you know, end up like the frogs. So the third part is that the law has not caught has, hasn't caught up to all of this technology development whatsoever. There are some people in the Congress who want to actually do something about this. Unfortunately, they're being drowned out by the likes of Google and Facebook and the lobbyists in D.C. who survive off of um, profiting off of our private information, essentially. I mean, you think Facebook and Google is free. It ain't free. It's not free. Um, so we have something called the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act, ECPA. ECPA is 25 years old. ECPA was made before many people here were born. ECPA was made before the internet existed in its present form. And this is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, people. Our laws are woefully out of date. We, I mean, we really need to, to get Congress to act on this. And there are some bills, there are some bills, we have some people in this state, Ed Markey is one of them who really cares about these issues. Um, so you should support Ed Markey um, in his quest to, to try to do something about ECPA. Um, but unfortunately, even those good laws, you know, Senator Leahy proposed one as well, even those good bills had giant glaring holes for what they call national security exemptions, which essentially means that the FBI and the NSA and the CIA don't have to listen, right? So this is a, this is a really serious problem. The third thing, and I'm going to stop talking soon because I've talked too much. The third thing is about local police, right? Instead of the FBI and the CIA only being involved in this kind of activity, now we have Boston police doing it. We have the Massachusetts State Police doing it. We have local police throughout the whole country doing it. Have you ever heard of see something, say something? Suspicious activity reporting? This is just scratching the surface of the local police's involvement in surveillance. Um, who here has heard of fusion centers? That's great. Not so many people, but a few. Fusion centers are actually spy centers. That's what we call them. The government calls them fusion centers because it sounds cool. We call them spy centers because that's actually what they are. There are places all over the country. There are 72 of them. There are two here in Massachusetts. There's one in Maynard, which is ostensibly run by the state police called the, called the Commonwealth Fusion Center. And there's one in Boston at Boston Police Headquarters called the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. These are spy centers where the police have face-to-face -face with the FBI, the military. Anybody know what posse comitatus is? doesn't exist anymore. It's a rule that was supposed to prohibit the military from engaging in domestic law enforcement. It's basically dead. The military is at these fusion centers interacting with the, with the police, with the FBI, um, potentially with the CIA, and, and actually also with private companies. Um, there was a case in Pennsylvania uh, not too long ago, last year, um, when that guy who was in the movie was a lesbian, what's his name, I forget, but he's, he's an actor, a famous actor, and he was involved in some anti-fracking work in uh, Pennsylvania against hydraulic drilling. Um, yeah, Mark Ruffalo. He was involved in some anti-fracking work. Um, he was really surprised to learn when he tried to get on a plane that he was on a terrorism watch list. Uh, this was because... The Pennsylvania Fusion Center was actually, um, had contracted out some of their intelligence work to a private company. The private company had ties to the, to the oil company that wanted to crack. And they basically spied on all these activists and 
Post them up and use reports saying they were terrorists. 